Exposition by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Luke 23, 33-46, John 19, 25-30. We have often read the story of our Saviour's sufferings, but we cannot read it too often. Let us, therefore, once again repair to the place which is called Calvary. As we just now sang, Come, let us stand beneath the cross. So may the blood from out his side fall gently on us, drop by drop. Jesus, our Lord is crucified. We will read, first, Luke's account of our Lord's crucifixion and death. Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand, and the other on the left. They gave Jesus the place of dishonor. Reckoning him to be the worst criminal of the three, they put him between the other two. They heaped upon him the utmost scorn which they could give to a malefactor, and in so doing they unconsciously honored him. Jesus always deserves the chief place wherever he is. In all things he must have the preeminence. He is king of sufferers as well as king of saints. 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How startled they must have been to hear such words from one who was about to be put to death for a supposed crime. The men that drove the nails, the men that lifted up the tree must have been started back with amazement when they heard Jesus talk to God, as his Father, and pray for them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Did ever Roman legionary hear such words before? I should say not. They were so distinctly and diametrically opposed to the whole spirit of Rome. Then it was, blow for blow, only in the case of Jesus, they gave blows where none had been received. The crushing cruelty of the Romans must have been startled, indeed, at such words as these, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 34, 35. And they parted his raiment, and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. The gambling soldiers little dreamed that they were fulfilling the 22nd Psalm, which so fully sets forth our Saviour's sufferings and which he probably repeated while he hung on the tree. David wrote, They parted my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. And the people stood beholding, gazing, looking on the cruel spectacle. You and I would not have done that, there is a public sentiment which has trained us to hate the sight of cruelty, especially of deadly cruelty to one of our own race, but these people thought that they did no harm when they stood beholding. They also were thus fulfilling the scriptures, for the seventeenth verse of the twenty-second psalm says, they look and stare upon me. 35. And the rulers also with them derided him, laughed at him, made him the object of coarse jests. 35. 36. Saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offering him vinegar. In mockery, not giving it to him, as they did later in mercy, but in mockery, pretending to present him with weak wine, such as they drank. 37. And saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. I fancy the scorn that they threw into their taunt, If you are the king of the Jews, that was a bit of their own save yourself, that they borrowed from the rulers. Sometimes a scoffer or a mocker cannot exhibit all the bitterness that is in his heart except by using borrowed terms, 
as these soldiers did. 38. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin and Hebrew, This is the King of the Jews. John tells us that Pilate wrote this title and that the chief priests tried in vain to get him to alter it. It was written in the three current languages of the time, so that the Greek, the Roman and the Jew might, alike, understand who he was who was thus put to death. Pilate did not know as much about Christ as we do, or he might have written, this is the king of the Jews and of the Gentiles, too. 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed at him, saying, If you are Christ, save yourself and us. He, too, borrows this speech from the rulers who derided Christ, only putting the words, and us, as a bit of originality. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. 4041. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we receive the reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. A fine testimony to Christ, this man has done nothing amiss, nothing unbecoming, nothing out of order, nothing criminal, certainly, but nothing even, amiss. This testimony was well spoken by this dying thief. 4246. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto you, Today shall you be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, and having said thus, he gave up his ghost. He yielded his life. He did not die, as we have to do, because our appointed time has come, but willingly the great sacrifice parted with his life, he gave up the ghost. He was a willing sacrifice for guilty men. Now let us see what John says concerning these hours of agony, these hours of triumph. John 19, 25 Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Last at the cross, first at the sepulchre. No woman's lips betrayed her Lord no woman's hands ever smote him, their eyes wept for him, they gazed upon him with pitying awe and love. God bless the Marys. When we see so many of them about the cross, we feel that we honor the very name of Mary. 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple standing by, whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, Behold your son. Sad, sad spectacle. Now was fulfilled the word of Simeon, Yes, a sword shall pierce through your own soul, also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Did the Saviour mean, as he gave a glance to John, Woman, you are losing one son, but he understands another who will be a son to you in my absence? Woman, behold your son. 27. Then said he to the disciple, Behold your mother. Take her as your mother, stand in my place, care for her as I have cared for her. Those who love Christ best shall have the honor of taking care of his church and of his poor. Never say of any poor relative or friend, the widow or the fatherless, they are a great burden to me. Oh, no. Say, they are a great honor to me, my Lord has entrusted them to my care. John thought so, 
let us think so. Jesus selected the disciple he loved best to take his mother under his care. He selects those whom he loves best, today, and puts his poor people under their wings. Take them gladly and treat them well. 27. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. You expected him to do it, did you not? He loved his Lord so well. 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. There was a prophecy to that effect in the Psalms, and he must fulfill it. Think of our dying Saviour prayerfully going through the whole of the scriptures and carefully fulfilling all that is the written concerning him, that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. 29. 30. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon his op, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, for he did receive it. It was a weak kind of wine, commonly drunk by the soldiers. This is not that mixed potion which he refused, wine mingled with myrrh, which was intended to stupefy the dying in their pains, when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink, for he would not be stupefied. He came to suffer to the bitter end the penalty of sin and he would not have his sorrow mitigated. But when this slight refreshment was offered to him, he received it. Having just expressed his human weakness by saying, I thirst, he now manifests his all-sufficient strength by crying, with a loud voice as Matthew, Mark and Luke all testify. 30. He said, it is finished. What, it, was it that was finished? I will not attempt to expound it. It is the biggest, it, that ever was. Turn it over and you will see that it will grow, and grow, and grow, and grow till it fills the whole earth, it is finished. 30. And he lowered his head, and gave up the ghost. He did not give up the ghost and then bow his head because he was dead. But he bowed his head as though in the act of worship, or as leaning it down upon his father's bosom, and then gave up the ghost. Thus have we had two gospel pictures of our dying Lord. May we remember them and learn the lessons they are intended to teach.